Test, test. There you go. So um, I had the pleasure in early September of going to Helsinki and hosting an OpenShift Commons gathering there. And there I saw one of the most exciting things, I know it's kind of geeky, but one of the most exciting things I've seen anybody do with OpenShift. And I'm gonna let Max um, Schultz from Vattenfall go into it, but if this doesn't um, make you excited about the potential for doing good with OpenShift, nothing will. So. Um, Without further ado, Max, thank you for coming all the way from Berlin. Uh, actually, from Amsterdam, yeah. From Amsterdam this time. All right, take it. Yeah, and I also want to say thank you, Diane, for bringing me here. I, I first thought that I would be the last person that fits into this community, but now that actually uh, Chris uh, and, and uh, Reza, I think, what's the name? Yeah. Um, they used the word commodity, then I feel right at home. Yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, exactly what we are all about. And I, I'm sure most of you have no idea what Runfa is, so I will give you a very, very brief introduction. Um, Vattenfall is one of the largest uh, utilities in Europe. Um, it's 100% owned by the Swedish state um, and is actually one of the biggest providers of uh, renewable energy worldwide. So top 20 uh, provider. Um, we have of course our largest fleet in Sweden, which is mostly hydropower and nuclear. Um, in Germany we also have coal uh, in the Netherlands gas and um, we are the biggest builder in Europe right now of new wind assets. So we're all about uh, renewable energy. And a couple of years ago, we changed our purpose um, to becoming fossil free in one generation. And usually here in the US and also in a lot of European companies, this is most of the time marketing or strategy people that come up with these sentences. Um, in this case, it's a bit different because this is a, an, an specific order by the Swedish state to completely decarbonize, um, first of all, Vattenfall's own production portfolio, uh, but also all of its customers. And all of its customers is quite significant because in the Nordics alone, 90% of all industrial customers are Vattenfall customers. And we are, for example, doing a project with the steel industry to get rid of gas and coal out of steel manufacturing processes and making them completely free of fossil fuels. Um, and when you look at Sweden, actually one of the biggest industries, and then now we can talk a little bit about more of, of tech, um, is the data center industry. Because uh, Sweden is very cold, you have availability of renewable energy, um, then there's lots of space. We actually see almost every single hyperscaler, AWS, Microsoft, Google, um, Facebook, they are all coming to Sweden and they're all building data centers of sizes that I don't think even you guys have seen. Um, it starts, it doesn't end at 300 megawatt size, it starts at 300 megawatt size. That's about 14 soccer fields of dimensions. Um, and they're all coming uh, to the Nordics and when they came, we started looking a bit more at data centers. Um, but before I talk about this, I have to bore you a bit because in order for my whole presentation to make sense, I have to explain you two things about the energy industry that is uh, important. And I'll try to keep it really short. Um, the first trend that you see in the, data, in, in the uh, energy industry uh, is renewable energy assets. So wind, solar, hydro has been around for quite some time, but wind and solar are quite new. And they introduce something to the energy system that the energy system is not designed to do, which is volatility. All of a sudden, I cannot predict and I cannot control the production of energy, which is really, really difficult. Um, the second trend, and we can do a little experiment, is decentralization. Um, decentralization means that all of a sudden your house has a solar panel on its roof and, or a battery in the basement or a heat pump or something like this. How many of you have an energy system maybe on their house or in their house? Not that many, okay. So if you do this in Norway or in Sweden, uh, I think like about 80% of the hands go up. And this introduces another big challenge because we used to be able to really forecast how you consume power. Actually, if you have a two family home, uh, two, two kids at home and a wife, I can really forecast your, your consumption curve really easily. But all of a sudden, if you produce your own energy and you produce energy that is again volatile, so solar, uh, you use your heat pump, you, maybe you charge your electric car at home, you're introducing even more unpredictability into the energy system. And this is important because the energy system, and uh, I got the feedback in Finland and in, in Norway that people didn't actually know this, uh, needs to be 100% stabilized. So supply needs to be always exactly matching demand. Uh, and this is expressed in the energy system with a frequency that is 50 hertz. Um, and this frequency is quite important because if, if, if we go one hertz off all your microwave clocks, every clock you have in your house will go about 10 to 15 minutes 
per day off track. Yeah? So a lot of these uh, electrical devices depend on the grid frequency. Um, in order to, to, to stabilize this frequency and to, to make supply meet demand in a world of volatility and renewables, um, we can do two things. We can learn how to store energy, which is what you hear Elon, Elon Musk say a lot, uh, that he builds gigantic lithium iron blocks. If I show you the cost of these lithium iron blocks and actually how unsustainable these things are, uh, you will also say, yeah, maybe we should do something else. Um, to give you an example, when you buy a Tesla, you need to drive it for eight years and power it entirely with renewable energy to be, make the car CO2 neutral. Yeah, because the, when you produce the, end, the battery, you need so much CO2 and you, you're, you're using so much um, minerals that you're actually making it worse. Huh? So it's a nice story, but it doesn't really work. And the other side is we can change how you consume power. And now you will think, oh, I already have energy-saving light bulbs at home. That's not really what I mean. But what I mean is, for example, your washing machine yeah, consumes a lot of power. What if I can send you a text message and say, hey, could you wait an hour until you wash your, your load or two hours? Because then we'll have wind and solar available. And that's what we're talking about. This is demand-side flexibility or demand response. And we actually believe that that will be one of the most important parts of the energy system. Now, data centers. Data centers, you can, we can have a very long argument here of how much they will grow. But I think we can all agree that their growth is needed. So we need more digital infrastructure in the future to run your applications, to run whatever deep learning, machine learning you want to do. And this, by the way, is without crypto mining, yeah? before people ask. Um, and data centers, they don't just consume any type of power. They come to us as a, as a utility and they say, ideally, I would like 100% reliable uninterrupted power supply, and yeah, that's great. Then we usually agree on uh, five nines or six nines or four nines, yeah? But if you listen to what I just said, if we want the world to run on renewables, it will be very hard to give you this number, right? It will be almost imp impossible for me to say, yeah, I can give you always up power. Um, I can do this, of course, you argue with nuclear, sure, that works, but do we want more nuclear assets around the world? Probably not. I can also do it with hydro in Sweden, but in the US, there's some hydro assets, but um, it is very difficult to do this with wind and, and solar power. So we, we started really looking into data centers and, and what, what is exciting for us. And the first thing we saw when we looked at the power consumption was, can we make it more flexible? Can we make a data center actually consume power um, in a more flexible manner? And the, the second thing we, we, we saw, and this actually as an energy utility got us very excited. You should have seen our colleagues in the heat department, um, when they found out that silicon chips produce 100% CO2 free heat. So literally a silicon chip takes power as an input, one megawatt, and makes about 0 0.99 megawatt in heat. That's, if, you, if you talk to the heat guys, this is awesome, yeah? because it's a very efficient power to heat system. And they, don't, they didn't think about cooling, they thought about how can we use this heat, how can we get it out? Yeah? And the data center operators were very confused, I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> And so, in order to, to, to test this, we decided that we're going to build a, an actual test bed. And now Red Hat will be very happy about what I'm going to say, because we, we first went to them, because we said maybe we can solve this purely on a software side, at least the, the flexibility uh, topic. And they were immediately jumping on board on this, not because necessarily they saw an opportunity to make money, but because they could really align with our vision to, to, to build a sustainable digital infrastructure, especially in the Nordics where we are all a bit more about sustainability, I would say. Um, and they said, yes, of course, you can do this a bit with OpenShift. You can start moving uh, Kubernetes containers around and we can figure out a way how to make it flexible. Um, and we also found some other partners, Cloud and Heat, that does the heat extraction for us. I'll explain how this works. Um, and Helio helps us look at compute as a more of a commodity. Um, and of course, NVIDIA got also very excited because for them, cooling these GPUs is actually a big problem. So uh, it became, they were excited to get rid of the heat. Um, and we also defined, okay, what's the KPI? How do we de define a sustainable digital infrastructure? And for us, it means we reuse 80% of the heat. Uh, that's a pretty high number, and uh, I'll explain to you how difficult this is. And um, we want power consumption to be flexible. Um, so, but in order to do this, like I said, we built two test sites now, 
And we also have a lot of confusion here because I always talk about containers, but I mean physical containers because we're building containerized data centers. Um, but there's some challenges because when you talk to data center people, you will hear a lot, they will say, yeah, of course we can give you the heat, it's no problem. We, we, will, uh, we will deliver uh, the heat out of the air, we extract it and we'll give it to you. Um, but they can give it to us at a temperature about 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius, which is useless heat. You can just throw it away right away. It, it, it doesn't make any sense because you can't transport heat at that temperature. So what we need is 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And in order to get this, um, we have to do two things. The first thing is we, we use water, of course. We use liquid cooling technology to get the heat out. But we, we cool the chips not with cold water, but with hot water. And we flow the water at such an incredible speed through the data center so that basically um, the inflow temperature of the data center is 55 degrees Celsius, so about 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and the outflow is 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can imagine how fast the water has to run to only heat up by, by 5 Kelvin. Yeah? That's the delta that we need. Um, and the other thing, though, if, if you look at the load curve of a data center, and you know that the chip only gets hot when it does something, right? So you need workloads. So a data center doesn't have a flat workload line. It is not running at 100% capacity all the time. If you're lucky, it runs at 40%. Um, so we had to, and, and right now we do this with OpenStack, we, we had to manipulate actually the workload. So, so sometimes when we have heat demand in winter where we really need a continuous flow of 60 degrees Celsius, um, we actually ramp up artificial workloads. So, so we, we cycle, we basically run the CPU on 100% so, to make heat. And ideally, we want to solve this problem by concentrating workloads on certain machines where we, where we can generate the heat. Um, and the second problem when it comes to energy flexibility, in order to actually make a data center energy flexible, you need to physically shut down servers. So we, because you cannot preserve energy just by shifting the workload, you actually need to physically shut down machines and systems. So what we started first was to use OpenShift to, to actually we, we are telling OpenShift part of the cluster will go down and then it automatically starts moving containers. Um, but then we also integrate really deeply with the UPS systems to actually um, remotely turn off the servers, yeah? uh, which is a bit trickier. Um, but all of this, it's, it's working now, but it's, uh, there's, there's one last challenge. It works for, for artificial workloads, so for, for, for HPC or simulations that just need the CPU. But the moment so far, when we throw data in, and we have some projects internally where we use really large data sets to forecast certain weather phenomenon, for example, um, we're talking about, about a petabyte of data that we need to shift around. So if I want to do this um, in a data center, I either need a very big fiber connection, uh, or I need to figure out a way how to just um, move subsets of data around, which is something, to be honest, that we haven't solved yet. And I actually hope that maybe some of you have some input on this and how to solve it, because uh, we would love to do it. Um, so, when we solve all these challenges, what's next? For, for us, it's not a commercial project at all, actually. Um, for us, it's all about showing the companies that are coming to the Nordics and showing maybe around the world that fossil-free um, digital infrastructure is possible, that doesn't depend on base load assets, so coal, gas, nuclear, um, and that the power consumption of a data center can be flexible. Um, and when I look at the talk that I, that this morning about OpenShift version 4, I think a lot of what you're looking at with multi-cloud setups and shifting workloads from different cloud providers is what we are looking at from an energy perspective in order to basically make the data center more interactive with the overall energy system and make workloads more energy flexible. And I think if we can find a way to bring energy utilities, I'm a software engineer, for me it's more logical, to, to bring utilities together with the data center industry and the software people and, and really um, to have them talk to each other I think there's a lot of great things we can do in terms of sustainability. I, I think for utility, I can tell you from my own experience now, we've been working on this for one and a half years, is that they stop thinking about a data center when the cable arrives uh, at the transformer, at the power station. Yeah? They have no idea what's going on in the data center and they don't care. But um, all of you know that non, none of, in a data center, none of the servers are running at 100% capacity. You can always shut down a certain part of it, but the data center people will say, ah, it's too risky. Huh? We we rather let everything run. So so there is a mismatch right now, and I think we can we can solve this by bringing people together and and, and have them talk to each other. Huh? That's it.